legalizefreedom.com. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is David Ditchfield who joins us to discuss his book, Shine On, the remarkable story of how I fell under a speeding train, journeyed to the afterlife and the astonishing proof I brought back with me. Across thousands of years, people have described one of the most astonishing of all human phenomena, the near-death experience. A near-death experience is a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close to death or in extreme physical or emotional crisis. The associated emotions are intense and most commonly include peace, love and bliss, although a substantial minority are marked by terror, anxiety or despair. Most people come away from the experience with an unshakable belief that they have learned something of immeasurable importance about the purpose of life. The more powerful the near-death experience, the more profound the after-effects. The ambitious reset their priorities, atheists change their values, doctors rethink their beliefs. In the modern world, dominated by scientific reductionism, near-death experiences are generally viewed as mere chemical byproducts of a dying brain. However, evidence that near-death experiences contain a profoundly important message for humanity continues to pile up, and the accounts recorded in best-selling books such as Raymond Moody's Life After Life and Kenneth Ring's Lessons from the Light are both fascinating and deeply moving. David Ditchfield returned from his near-death experience with amazing artistic abilities previously unknown to him. And this is his story. Hello and welcome, David, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks for having me along. David, what I normally do at this point is give an overview of what we're going to be discussing. And today, as I set out in my recorded intro, it's near-death experiences, specifically the one that happened to you. Uh, and the next thing I do is I say to the guest, tell listeners a little bit about your background, but that's basically what we're here to do. So I think we can dispense with that uh, because we're going to be talking about your life prior to your experience and, of course, subsequently, you know, how things have changed. So where to start really is... Did you know anything about near-death experiences specifically before what happened to you happened? No, not at all. I, I knew nothing of the word or anything about it. it. It didn't really come into my life, as it were, really at that point, because I was kind of living, you know, by the moment, as it were, and I wasn't really very spiritual and didn't think about much about any thoughts of the afterlife or or spirituality. So no, it didn't enter my sphere. <laughs> Were you? Did you have any interest in uh, anything esoteric or paranormal or just anything outside of the very narrow mainstream view of reality? Well, I, I didn't. I mean, funnily enough, I I was introduced to it um, by I was I was on on the way up to see my sister in Cambridge. I've been living in London uh, up until the the accident itself. And uh, I'd been going through hard times, to be honest with you. So, so I just needed a break. And my sister said, "Come and stay with us in the family." And they live in the country in, in Cambridge. So I was on the train travelling up, and I and I came across a, a lovely elderly couple sat opposite me. And the lady got chatting to me, and she said, "Oh, we're going to see a medium tonight, and she's really good." I was going, "Oh, okay, you know." <laughs> and uh, she was very insistent on giving me like a flyer. Um, you know, a small poster all about it. And so, so I took it politely and put it in my pocket, forgot all about it, arrived at my sister's and there was a lot of chaos going on at the time, you know, she was sorting out the kids. So I thought, I'm just going to go to the pub, have a drink and, uh, just chill out for a bit. And I pulled that leaflet out of my pocket and I looked at it and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to go. And it was one of those things. There was no reason I wasn't at all fascinated by whether I get any messages through. I was just, 
I was curious, so I went along. And I arrived at this very packed um, spiritualist church, a very tiny spiritualist church in the town, and uh, managed to get a seat, sat down. And all these people were getting messages coming through from this really fantastic medium who was just pacing backwards and forwards, you know, connecting with her guides. And suddenly she, she turned around and she picked out me and she said, man in the blue sweater over there, um, your life's about to change. And I went, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, again, I wasn't looking for any messages from any loved ones who passed on or anything like that. But I thought, well, this sounds good. I'm up for that, you know, because I needed a, a life change big time, you know. And, um, but I figured she meant, you know, I'm going to win the lottery or get the girlfriend that I was after and stuff. Anyhow, I said, in what way is it going to change? And she said, they're not telling me. And she was like talking to these guides almost like, you know, out, outwardly saying, yes, 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 you know. And, um, she said, but it's going to be big. They're telling me it's going to be big and be ready for it. So. That was it. And I went away and didn't really think anything of it until I actually had my accident and my near-death experience. And then straight afterwards, I thought, that's, that came right back to me. I thought, that's what, that's what that message was that came from that medium. <laughs> yeah, quite often when people talk about, you know, like w w wishing for, for change in their life or praying for it, you know, and we're always enjoined, you know, be careful what you wish for sort of thing. Yes. Because <laughs> sometimes the things that, that do change, or the people and the things that enter our lives are not what we were expecting, not what we thought we wanted. But of course, you usually tend to get what you need in these situations. Uh, reading the early part of your book, and this is as so you're you'd moved to London to try again, actually, to try and change your life for the better. Uh, mm -hmm. When you were living in, and barely working down there, I have to say there was, I mean, this very grippingly told. Even it, though it's it's just one man's day to day life, but there are certain points where it's absolutely excruciating, and by that I mean it's difficult to mm. read. You met this girl. Now, you've, in the, your book, some of the people in your story, you've changed their names. This is quite standard practice. But the yeah. lady that you refer to as Emily in the book that you met uh, in London, mm. that whole episode was excruciating for me to read just what what you went through. Um, and and this, after all, is something that you thought might have been the answer to that, that you, you thought she might have represented this change that the medium spoke about. That's right. You, that's absolutely <laughs> what happened. I mean, again, I was just chasing after all the wrong things in my life, um, you know, and I just figured that I looked at her. She was very beautiful and uh, very self-confident. And I just figured to myself, you know, that's what I needed in my life. And I thought that that would fix everything. All the time I was looking for a quick fix, if you like, because I'd basically left school without any qualifications. I, I, I'm dyslexic, actually, and I didn't get actually diagnosed with that when I was at school but leaving school without any qualifications it was tough for me to get by and find work and um, and so most of the work I was picking up living in London was was manual labouring work and which meant going down to the local pub and literally hanging out there and saying hey you know hustling for work as it were so it was and so chasing after a, a, a somebody like that <laughs> all the gears were grinding because of course she had no respect for me whatsoever which is wrong because there's nothing wrong with, with the kind of work that I was trying to do. But there you go. Um, yeah, I was just chasing after all the wrong things. And so I wanted to put that into the book because I'm, it's, it, I'm very keen to sort of stress the difference between what my life was like before until after the actual event of the near-death experience itself. I don't think it's too strong a word to use the word empty. That's how reading about your life felt at the time. You might, I don't know if you felt that it was like that or whether you had a, because you were inside it, living the life that you, you felt it was as much as you felt you'd painted yourself into a corner that there was still, uh, you know, you obviously still kept getting, getting up in the morning and, and, and going out. But it, yeah. it's, it seemed, it's, I know it's hindsight is 2020, but because I basically knew that the overall direction of your story before I started the book, you know, I knew that better things were ahead. But mm. again, it just seemed that you were you were going through the motions, really. You know, I was. something something had to give eventually. Exactly, I was going through the motions. Uh, you know, I, I was drinking heavily as well, which is in the book, and uh, you know that was again to try and fix something. It, you know, put a patch over it, as it were. You know, and that wasn't working. So I was just drinking more and more heavily because I began to loathe myself so much in my existence and uh 
I used to look around at even the other guys who were working on the building sites, and I thought they're a lot happier in their skins doing what they're doing because they're doing a much better job than I was. I was I wasn't cut out for manual labouring <laughs> at all, you know. And these girls, guys who were working on the sites were much more skilled, so obviously a lot happier. So even that wasn't making me happy. Um, so, so yeah, my whole existence was was extremely empty and uh, and very very lonely. What was your your upbringing like? Because um, not you to, I know you've done your fair share of you know psychotherapy in the, in the wake of of all this, but um, what was your upbringing like with regards to where you found yourself at that stage in your life? You know that that bad place that you you were in. Um, would you, did you feel it was primarily just coming from within you? Did you feel that the circumstances outside of you that were running against you and made it difficult for you to get ahead? You know, did you have a happy childhood, for example? Um, well, I, basically, it all went wrong once I started at secondary school because because I was failing so badly at everything that I used to get awful reports saying that I was uh, I was lazy and and that I was a troublemaker. You know, that I was just considered bad news, and I and I didn't see myself as being like that at all. I, I wanted to try. I wanted to believe you, me. I wanted to succeed. You know, at something. And, and I wasn't, and, and that reflected as well because I was these, I was bringing these bad reports home to my family. And of course we had to go through it, you know, and, uh, with a fine tooth comb. And, and so I just grew up feeling an awful lot of, um, shame and guilt. Like I always used to say that guilt was my middle name and that just became more and more, it became worse with age as it were, you know, because I never really shook that off, that feeling of, of feeling like, sort of like very insignificant you know and, and a complete failure in in all senses of the word so and so obviously i was aiming high all the time and, and because i wanted that to reflect on me and so everything i aimed for was, was completely the wrong avenue you know I, I, so, <laughs> so so yeah nothing in my life was authentic basically you know it was all on a, on a surface level yeah the thing with dyslexia is um I know I've met a few people over the years who, who've uh, suffered from it and people of various ages as well. You know, so obviously it's well on, fairly well understood today, but I think people often wonder, someone like yourself, how you could have, um, an issue like that. And maybe not even your parents, apparently. I mean, you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's kind of twig that there's something perhaps amiss here and that may, may talk to some specialists or something. I don't know. Maybe that, that just, that didn't exist when you were that age. Yeah, it, it it wasn't really something that that was like now. Everything is, you know. I've seen seen my uh, my brother and my sister. You know, I've got nephews and nieces, and I've seen them grow up. And everything is so much better now. Yeah? Everything's geared up for you've only got to have one slight sort of learning disability, and it's dealt with straight away. And there's one to one teachers and all things like that. So you know, so yes, it, it's definitely a generation thing that, that just wasn't taken seriously i'm sure my parents would have done if, if that had been the case but it just wasn't offered to them really so it's no it was no, through no fault of their own really but um you know i i was a very sensitive child and i and i think so i i couldn't i couldn't handle that because i didn't see us I, I became almost like that kind of label i thought well i am a troublemaker so i'll just hang out with all the kids who are on the outside <laughs> of the uh, system as it were and um but I was very sensitive, so I wasn't like those kids really. So, so again, the gears were always grinding for me because I didn't fit in anywhere. I did, no, no matter what I tried, no, whichever way I went, I just didn't fit in, and I just couldn't find, you know, me. I couldn't, I couldn't be happy with myself. I couldn't be comfortable in my own skin. So, so, so it, it was, um, yeah, it, it was a lifelong battle trying to discover exactly where I needed to go to find that purpose in my life. Well, from what we learn about the, you know, the members of your family, they seem to be, including your parents, they seem to be just ticking along just fine as it were. So that, that yeah. probably compounded these feelings for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There was, you know, the, both my brother and sister were kind of, you know, they went through school fine. My brother did. He went on to university. And, and so, you know, it was like sort of, and my sister, got married happily and, and stuff so it was all it was all for them everything seemed to go fine and uh you know there was no singling out of, of me and like you know but but i but i always did feel like the troublemaker i mean interestingly enough on the on the day of the accidents you know uh when my my family came to the hospital 
and believe it or not, I'm, I was lying there in the emergency department apologizing to my mum, saying, I'm so sorry. It's always me causing all the dramas. It's always me messing up, basically, you know. And she was like in tears, you know, just glad that I was alive and, and just telling me, no, it's not your fault, which it wasn't, you know, of course. But it, you know, it's interesting that I took that feeling of shame and guilt right up, to, up until that point of f- feeling like I'd messed up even, even on that day. <laughs> Uh, by the way, if any movie producers are listening to this, I think this would make an excellent film. Uh, the oh, story laid out in your book—it's got—it's got all the ingredients. And I, maybe it's just the way my mind works. But when I was reading your book, I—I I, I was—I could see all these scenes. If you see what I mean, you know, yeah. these, these events. And so, prior to your accident, now you met again. Names changed, uh, but the girl you referred to in the book is Anna. And mm-hmm. that was a real glimmer of light, I think, you know, for, as, from a reader's point of view anyway, that, that's, that seemed positive from the get go. But of course, it didn't go straightforwardly, shall we put it that, like that, yeah. uh, to say the least. And it was, it was she that w- was with you on the day of the accident. So perhaps we need to know, if, because people are probably wondering, what accident, what accident? We, we probably just mm. need to uh, maybe explain what actually uh, what took place. Cause you, you, you were, you were back at, uh, home, you, you, temporarily moved out of London at this point, hadn't you? That's right, yeah. So again, uh, my, my drinking had, had, had progressed into a, into a really bad stage and then I wasn't picking up work and so I was completely broke. And so that's when my sister said, you know, you need to come and stay with us. Um, you know, otherwise it's just, just this isn't going to work out. You know, things are going to get really bad for you. So she could see that I'd, I'd hit rock bottom basically. So yes, yeah, so I, I was staying with my sister and her family temporarily up in cambridge and um so yeah anna who we we talked of just then uh i'd met her only you know not too long since before all this happened and uh we we connected we just had this connection she was great and she said i'll i'd like to come and stay for a couple of days um, by the phone i said yeah that'd be brilliant so she came up and we just hung out and had a really lovely time together and uh she had to make her way back to london she got something to get back for so um i i saw her off at, at the tra- railway station you know and we arrived on the platform and uh the train pulled in and i, I helped her on on with her bags on onto the train and i gave her a hug and a kiss and then you know saying goodbye to her and um and then the emergency buzzer started going off of the doors just closed and uh she was saying, come on, you've got to get off. I was going, yeah, yeah, don't worry. And as I stepped back, um, it was a cold February day. So I was wearing like a thick sort of, um, quarter, three quarter length coat and, uh, it got caught in the, in the closing doors. The automatic doors just slammed to on the bottom edge of this coat and I could not release it. You know, I tried everything I pulled and nothing was happening and I turned around and, look for a guard and I couldn't see anybody. So I just shouted for help, you know, at the top of my voice. Nobody came. Um, in fact, there was only one other guy on the platform who was also seeing off his girlfriend or what have you, you know, and, uh, he was, uh, he was going to me, take your coat off, mate, you know, and I was just thinking, well, I just knew that it wasn't going to come off because it was like a, a quality sheepskin. And so it was like, I knew that it was going to grip all the way down my arms and everything. And it, that just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. So I started banging on the window and everything, banging, hoping that somebody might come through a guard on, on the train itself, but nothing happened. And so I remember the engine started to rev up and I was looking straight into the eyes of my friend Anna and I could just see the look of terror in her face. And at that moment, I just thought, I'm going to die. You know, this is it. And, um, Anyway, the, the engine started to rev up more and then the, the tra- train started pulling out and it started coming out at quite a, a speed. It's amazing. You don't realize until you're actually attached to a train on the outside just how fast they go as they pull out. And I lost my footing and I got dragged along the platform and then I got pulled between the space of the platform edge and the actual train itself. And down I went uh, down into this kind of dark pit of <laughs> sheer horror and um and i looked up i remember seeing just like seeing it's almost like seeing the sides of the carriage disappear up into the sky and then i went and uh and i was thrown around like a rag doll in, in in this kind of violent sort of frenzy and um 
and um, it was like being tossed around in, in, in a sort of in a mincer or whatever. You know? And I suddenly found myself lying in between the track as a train kind of sped heavily over my over my. I could hear it going heavily. I, I mean, in terms of sound uh, above my head, and um, I just kept my face down into, into the oily gravel, and I just lay there thinking it's not over yet you know some of the undercarriage could just come and whack me over the back of the head and that would be it it would all be over but that didn't happen you know and the trains just suddenly disappeared off down the track and there i was <laughs> alive and i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe that i'd survived yeah i actually thought when i was reading about this that you had come away relatively unscathed uh, and of course unless someone's had a terrible accident like yours, there's no way to try and explain to someone what you feel, what you don't feel. But we do know from your story and um, from, you know, hearing about these things sometimes in the media that people can sustain, you know, very serious injuries and not actually be aware of it initially due to adrenaline and other things. Uh, maybe there's other things in the body that kick in, but you, you did have a extremely nasty injury indeed, which... When you described it in the book, it, you know, well, it must have been almost difficult to to get it across in words, you know, whether you're speaking or writing. Yeah, it is. It's true, actually. It is very hard to get across because it's it's like something that that the the mind and body should never have to go through, and and uh, it's just. I mean, I talked about this afterwards because I had to have some therapy to to deal with it, obviously, and uh, and I said to the therapist, it's just. You know, it, it's it's almost like I can't explain how how hard it, it it shatters your whole being. You know, it just it really does. It's just kind of like like I say that I use the term the ragdoll scenario because that's how I felt. Because I felt like it was me or flesh and blood uh, and bones against this massive monster, like this massive metal sort of huge empty, but not empty, but <laughs> huge vehicle you know and it was just um it, it just seems it's, it's it's a violent thing to have to go through and it really is and, it, and it's, uh, it's it's very hard to put it into words but I, I hope i did put it into words as best as possible and uh you know <laughs> it's um yeah i sustained some pretty awful injuries I, it's funny actually because i did in I, I had some internal injuries as well which i didn't realize up until um, only about um three years ago <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, t- I t- got some heavy b- bleeding in, inside me. <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, so, so it, but it, 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 the, the main injury that really was, was really horrible was the fact that I'd, I'd, um, my left arm had been severed, um, from, from the elbow down. And, and that was one of the first things that I saw when I was lying on the track. So I looked, I kind of looked to survey myself as you do, you know, when you just had a fall, it, even just a slight fall, you look to see oh, what, what we're done, you know, you look at your hands or whatever, you know, and I just saw that this coat had been completely ripped to shreds. And then there was my arm, which was also ripped to shreds. And, um, and, you know, um, the f- interesting thing was, was I didn't go into like this kind of state of blind panic and, and, and stuff. I was actually quite calm, and I remember actually looking, and I could see all the inside of my arms, and I kind of thought, "Wow, that's that's amazing. That's how my arm works. That's that's the inside of me." <laughs> so that was kind of like quite a powerful moment that so sort of stayed with me. That for some reason, I don't know whether that was shock or what, but yeah. Um, so, well, I'm sure you've had people say at the time, whether it was doctors or whatever. Uh, you're a very lucky young man or whatever, you know, sort of thing, basically by, by being alive. Uh, it's always difficult one to call, isn't it? You know, how does falling under a train count as being lucky? Uh, but mm. it's just good. Well, given that it's happened, then I suppose the fact that you didn't quite walk away from it, but you're here now to talk about it. So it's just a question of perspective, isn't it, really, how you view these things? It is, actually, because um, there's, I had a few people turn around to me at first, you know, and, and say, you know, People I hadn't met before, just strangers who'd seen it in the news and stuff like that or whatever. It was on the local news a lot of the time in the papers and stuff. And, and people was going, God, you were unlucky that day, weren't you, mate? And I was going, no, I was lucky that day, you know, and that's how I felt about it. I, 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 and I still do. I feel that I was lucky that day. I mean, the rail police, I mean, the national rail police were called in to investigate the whole thing, you know, and they took the train down to Finsbury Park and 
they told me that they stripped the carriage right down to the door to the last rivet. You know, that's how much they put into it. And it took a year to investigate. And when, when they concluded it, the head of the rail police turned around to me and said, you know what? We've got to say that we all put, shook our heads afterwards and said that you shouldn't have survived this. You should, you should be dead. We don't get it. We don't know how you survived. And I remember smiling at him and I thought, should I start going into the story about what happened to me, you know, mm. next, you know, or not? And I just thought, no, I won't do, but, I... <laughs> but there you go. Yeah. So in terms of um, science, I should not be alive in terms of, you know, that the, the police investigations, I should not be alive, but something more powerful than me and all of us saved me that day and uh, gave me a chance. You experienced some sort of what you, you would probably call time dilation, I think, at that point as well. And a lot of people who have had accidents, serious accidents like yourself, they, they talk about the, the weird, you know, how reality seems to shift, you know, time and space and their, you know, their sense of uh, hearing sometimes, all sorts of distortions take place shall i say i i had a a very big car accident in the early 90s i was completely unharmed again it's a, a miracle but mm. the uh the car i was driving and i was going about 80 miles an hour a little bit over the speed limit and mm. my car hit an oily patch and it started to go spin in 360 degree turns Wow. And I think it spun about a dozen times, and while it was spinning, it crossed into the opposite lane with the oncoming traffic coming the other way. Oh my god! Yeah, and so I yeah. I clipped a car. Luckily, it didn't it wasn't a full on contact, yeah. but I clipped the other car and then kept going diagonally through a fence on the other side of the road into a field. And when the car oh. eventually stopped spinning, I remember the radio was still playing. There was music on. I was playing. I think it was a cassette back then, but the, <laughs> the, mu- the the engine had stopped, but the music was still playing. And I remember just thinking, okay. And I looked down at my legs and I touched my thighs with my hands. And that was just kind of what you described, the, just the, like the little audit, you know, have I been, have I been cut in half? You know, yeah. Um, yeah. My, is my head still on? You know, mm. things like that. And one thing that I did notice as the car was spinning was that... I, I could, it felt like it was a lot longer than it was. You know, at that speed, it could yes. only have been a few seconds. But I remember the car going round and me going, Oh, we're going round again. Oh, we're going mm-hmm. round again. Yes. And the thoughts, <laughs> in, the thoughts in my head were a lot slower than the action outside. Yeah. So, and you described that when you were lying on the track, didn't you? Well, yeah, because, um, it was interesting. Again, going back to the rail police, um, I asked them how long it took from me you know the train pulling out and me going under and and it was they, they said it was 13 and a half seconds because it was all cctv and stuff you know and i was going wow i said i thought it was minutes like because I, i'd literally got time to think through in my head i thought i went into survival mode i thought right i've got to survive this now i've got to think of something and so i remembered seeing a, this news clip on the tv a few weeks previous where a young child had been thrown thrown from a burning apartment block and had survived without any broken limbs. And they said that's because young infants um, don't tense up. You know, they're all very loose and lucid and stuff. And so uh, I figured, right, that's my only chance is to, to relax. And that's exactly what I did. And in fact, when I spoke to Anna afterwards, this is, she, we were chatting in the hospital at one point, And then she said, uh, she said, it's, I ran, she said, I ran through the carriage just to, to watch to see if you were okay. And she said, and I saw you go under. And she said, you know, what was, what was really strange? And I said, what? She said, you seem to go under so gracefully. <laughs> and, and I thought that's because I'd had that, I had that time to think it through. I actually saw a, watched a documentary re- recently with a, a, a guy, it's an American guy who does studies into the brain. And apparently he said that that happens a lot with people who are facing, uh, like yourself as well, you know, sort of near, not near death experiences, but you know, where they're life threatening, uh, that's it, life threatening, uh, incidents that they, their brain slows down and, the, and that's what happens. So it's a, it's a very interesting. So it does actually, there's a scientific <laughs> explanation for it that well, so they say, but yeah, so you have that as well. Yeah. It was just the, the sense of time changed and it was, it was very, very strange indeed because. But I, and also I remember feeling calm as well, which is I think something you referred to. I, I remember thinking that I, could, I remember thinking this is bad, but I also 
remember thinking you can't do anything about this. People would assume that you're going to sit in the car, as in my case, screaming your head off going, oh yeah. my God, oh my God. But it wasn't yeah. like that at all. It was just almost serene, to be honest. And the other thing mm. I found very curious, and I've, because I've talked to a lot of people who had, uh, um, when I say similar experience to you, I mean, you know, anyone's had a similar experience, but you know what I mean. Mm. And they've talked about uh, things going quiet. And it was, everything seemed to go very quiet and still and like there must have been quite a lot of noise around me because it was, it was mid morning and it was a busy road. But mm. I, I just remember the silence, <laughs> you know, for those few seconds. So that was, yeah. that was very curious. Yeah. Well, you were being protected that day as well, you know, by the sounds of it big time, you know, from what happened to you. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to actually then to get out of the car and just walk. And I you know I didn't have any medical examination after that. Perhaps I should have, but. Uh, obviously, this was a long time ago. But oh, by yeah. the way, when when was your accident? Because I, I, I don't just I don't really have a timeline in my mind. Oh right, yeah, it was two thousand and six. Okay, okay, yeah. so quite a while ago. Yeah, there may be people who've listened to this if you're familiar with the rail system in the UK and think how could that possibly happen. But without going into details, that they did put out a report and there was a couple of failings. The driver did, didn't do what he should have done, for example, and. Uh, there should have been people on the platform checking that all the doors were clear, for example, before they blow the whistle and the train moves off. Well, they changed after after my accident. The, the rail police said, look, we've changed, uh, I think it was six points, uh, uh, the safety measures that are going to go throughout the whole of the UK network now. So <laughs> all those are in place, which is great. So if ever I step on a train now, I, I, I know so, so some of those measures that have been put there, and I think, ah, that's one good thing to have come out of this. <laughs> so, So, yeah. At that moment when you said to yourself, I'm going to die, is there any way to describe feeling, you know, actually facing that as a possibility? Not just, you know, it could be a bit exaggerated. You know, for example, you could get, you you could find yourself, I'm trying to think of an example. Maybe someone might fall down a mine shaft and not be able to get Mm -hmm. help. And you you could be lying down there and thinking, I I may die here. But it's not quite as immediate as what you were facing. So I'm just wondering, what does what runs through your mind, your emotions, or does it tend to be that more stillness and kind of just acceptance? Well, actually, I, I would say that from my point of view, I was actually in between the two because I had got some time to think about it that I that I was going to die. Uh, nothing like lying in a mine shaft and thinking, you know, for, for days on end or what have you, or hours on end. But I'd still, it wasn't like an instant thing where you know I was hit head on. You know, in a car collision, I, I, I knew that as the engines were revving up and not my coat was stuck, that this was probably it. So I got that time to think it through. But it's interesting because one thing I've learned from it all, and I say to other people that in terms of fear and facing death and, you know, in the eye, as it were, is, um, the anticipation is far worse than the actual reality of it, if you like. I wouldn't say that, you know, I was totally calm. Obviously, I was terrified, but I was a lot more in control of the situation than what I ever thought I would be. For example, if if, you, if someone had said to me literally minutes before, right, here's a scenario, your coat's going to get caught in the, in these closing doors and you're going to get pulled along the, the, the platform and dragged under, I'd be absolutely would have been terrified out of my skin, going, no, I would have been, you know, screaming, no, 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 but... The reality of it happening wasn't like that. I did, I, I, I suppose, like I said earlier, I, I went into survival mode. I, I thought I've got to try and survive this. When obviously we, you had a near death experience, which we'll come to now. Um, and I've said a little bit in my recorded introduction, just for anybody who's going, what's a near death experience? Well, I've just put that in a couple of sentences, but I had yeah. assumed that this was going to occur, uh, when you were under the train. Cause that just, mm. that just seemed to be. I thought it's going to happen now, isn't it? You know, but it was actually later on when you were in the hospital that this occurred. And at that point, I think the medical team anyway felt that that you were stabilized to the point where your life was no longer at risk or they had established that it wasn't. But in any event, it was in the hospital bed that you had your experience. Well, not really the hospital bed, actually. It was, I was on the trolley in the, in the A and E department. Um, so I, I was still being they were still pretty running around and pretty panicked but yeah um even if they felt i was stabilized i, I was losing copious amounts of blood uh by that point you know i remember my my sister saying that you know to me afterwards she said that there was just so much blood on the floor that you know because they came in 
in to, in to see me just before I, w- I went to, into the theatre, and she said that she was worried she was going to slip over. So it, it had got pretty bad in, uh, in terms of, of the amount of blood loss that was that was happening. But yeah, I mean they were keeping me calm, and I mean I'm, the, the actual consultant who took care of me throughout the whole event was was there and he was very brilliant he was like you know he, he relaxed me and stuff and, um but yeah but that's that's that was the point where 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 it, where it all happened when i was lying in in the a and e department and that's that's where i had my near-death experience so again you've attempted to do this in your book to describe it and indeed as people will find out subsequently uh you know you found other other creative outlets to try and convey something of your experience uh, specifically painting and music but i've never had an experience anything like that uh, or any any sort of transcendental you know out of body type experience beyond very very strange dreams um sure. i can't say i've experienced anything like that but it's always fascinating reading about them because it touches something that i can't quite explain and i've talked with other near-death experience researchers, including Penny Satori, and Mm. they say that even reading about people's uh, beneficial experiences here here can have, you know, benefit for for the reader, you know, and and I do feel that it's true. You read about enough of these experiences, you you sort of come away a little bit changed. Yes, oh yeah, completely. It's, it is, it's, um, it's, it's, I came away totally changed from it. I mean, I mean, when I first as soon as I was back, back to earth, crashing down to earth, as it were, you know, um, most people say to me, Oh, you must have felt disappointed that you, you know, you, you couldn't have stayed in that beautiful place that you've been to. But of course, yeah, <laughs> the part of me was, but ultimately I was just so charged with the energy of what had happened. Um, that I just couldn't wait to sort of find out what my purpose was and why it had happened and how I was going to tell the world about this because, as we started the interview off by saying, I had no idea near-death experiences happened to anyone. I thought it just happened to me at that point. I thought it was just me that had only seen the other side, been to the afterlife, and I thought I'd been sent back for a reason. So I've got, I've got to find out how to sort of get this across. So, so yeah, so that's when I started immediately wanting to paint i wanted to paint what i'd seen because i thought that's the best way to record it you know because I, th- I was i was also very scared i was going to forget everything <laughs> that it was all gonna it was such a big thing that happened i thought i've got to record this but of course i've never forgotten a single part of it but yeah so so it, it changed me from that point of view that i it opened me up creatively to sort of start doing large paintings you know and and on canvas and 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 surprised myself just how good the work was that was coming through. And then, then I went, then going on to compose classical music for orchestra, which was even more of a shock because I'm, I'm not, I've got no training in it whatsoever. And, and I've since spoken to people who are classically trained and playing orchestras and conductors and stuff. And I said, Oh, you must have written, you know, pieces yourself. And they're going, No, there's no way. There's no way it even begin to start writing a symphony, you know, so. They were kind of going, I don't know how you did it. How did you pull that out of the back? But, um, you know, it was all down to the, the actual near death experience itself because, uh, I was, I was being, I was being led. I was being, I was being encouraged and, and educated, if you like, to be able to do all these things. And, um, and still am, you know, I still feel like them. I'm getting ideas coming through from the other side. So to help me get this message across to people because um it's a positive one you know it's it's not like it's not something like that i'm trying to sort of you know preach to people or what have you and, because it's not because it's not all about saying you know you've got to do good in your life to to, to you know to, to reach this this point because i think we'll all reach it but you know basically death is not the end it's 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 not we don't you know our bodies don't well our bodies switch off like a light but our souls continue on you know onto the and it's just the next stage of the journey uh, as far as i can see well the idea that before birth after death there, there is nothing but a black void of nothingness yeah. uh, is a relatively new idea uh, for our species anyway and it's still not you know accepted across the whole world uh, because for untold thousands of years as far, as far back into time as we can go 
religions, mystery traditions, you know, indigenous spiritual traditions, they were all saying very similar things, which is, you know, that death is not the end, you know, yeah. that there is there are other dimensions of existence and reality. Uh, but I say it's only really since the scientific revolution that we've come to the Richard Dawkins view of it, you know, that it's just, you know, that uh, even consciousness is an illusion or whatever, and there's no such thing as a soul, um, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the lady you refer to as Irene in your book, uh, she was the person, the therapist who was working with you to talk through uh, That's right, everything yeah. that had happened in the book when she's talking and she's saying science and faith just don't fit. That's exactly what I was thinking of when I read that. I just thought that's just quite naive because they, they, they were two sides of the same coin for a very long time. And I think mm. there's, there's perhaps a convergence, a reconvergence underway. Certainly when you look at the cutting edge scientific research into the quantum realm, uh, you know, mm. and, and, and putting that together with all sorts of experiences like yours. Uh, which increasingly are being studied scientifically. They are, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a, an important change yeah. as well. And I think that Irene did actually change her view of near-death experiences in your time together somewhat. Um, but, yeah. But, you know, they, they, the people who try and explain away the near-death experience by body chemistry and brain chemistry or whatever, mm -hmm. the, the thing that does trip them up is, you know, your your ability to paint and compose symphonies, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It's, it's, it is quite remarkable <laughs> that I'm that coming from, as I say, from what I, my life was like before to, to now doing this is I'm, I'm surprising myself. I, you know, I just, I mean, basically the work that I'm doing now, I, I just know that it's not all me that's producing this. I just know that I enjoy, for example, listening to when I'm writing music, you know, or doing a painting, I, I, I sit back at the end of the day and I'll play it back or look at what I'm doing. I think, wow, that's great. And I'm actually a, a, a fan of my own work without larging it up too much because, because I know that it's coming from somewhere else. And I, I literally sit there and look up and go, thank you. you know, whoever's helping me with this at the moment. Thank you so much, you know, but I guess that was, you know, when I said that everyone who's had a near death experience, they come back with the same thing. When I've spoken to other people who've had them, they immediately they're lying in hospital saying they're charged with all this energy. I mean, I couldn't move. For, for weeks, you know, I was like lying in bed and I could not move, but inside me, I was like, wow, I've got to go. What am I going to do? You know, and, uh, and everyone says that they come back saying, what is my mission? What am I going to do? So everybody finds their, their path. You know, a lot of people go out there and, and, and talk, do lots of talking and you know, they'll travel all around the world and become, you know, well, well known speakers, you know, and like, and, uh, so it's, we, we've all got to find out what it is that, We've all got a same mission, and that is to be able to sort of talk about what our experience and, and be able to share it with people and, and say, look, you know, there, there is an afterlife. And I mean, going back to the, the, you know, the question of science and, and stuff, I mean, it's no scientist has, has actually found a, a, you know, a scientific formula that, to my knowledge anyway, that, that on love you know and love is like a universal thing that we all experience and go through whether it's through the love of our families or dogs or pets or or our lovers but there's, there doesn't seem to be like a real you know oh well yeah well here's the formula for that that's why that's why love happens do you know what i mean so so if if we can't find a, you know a solution <laughs> of why we all fall in love and, and why it happens uh, through science and then how can we assume that you know we're that arrogant that we know it all that oh yes that there's no afterlife the, the brain closes down and that's the end of it you know i mean <laughs> you know that, that's kind of my take on it though i mean scientists you know we need scientists I, I i actually wouldn't be here now without science i mean science saved me in hospital you know the doctors and the nurses and the, and the whole team and all the scientists that behind saving me saving my arm even you know were, were, were fantastic and, uh, and i never disrespected them at all and still don't for, for their work so um you know but it, but it's great that it is being researched a lot more well science is associated with rationality and if something's called not non-scientific that's a derogatory statement uh, mm. You know, I'm not saying I think that, but that a lot of people feel that. You know, oh, one, no, one, yeah. one way to denounce someone is to call their work non-scientific. So, it, but it's you know, science become associated exclusively with this, with rationality, but rationality will only take you so far, and that's not an appeal mm. to, to irrationality. You know, there there are things, there are other ways of getting information about the world. Science is just one of them. And I yeah. think also in our modern age, because particularly you know, quite a long history now of 
atrocities uh, being committed in the name of religion or at the very least religion not really offering anything much to people in the way of real experience. It seems like there's a load of dogmatic old rituals that the meaning of which has been forgotten. Sure. That being the case, then I think people are terrified of anything that sounds... Uh, you know, rings the spiritual bell because then it's like it, it almost is letting religion in by the back door, if you know what I mean. So I think a lot of people are nervous about experiences like yours because they see it as pseudo religious in some way, uh, which it is mystical, un undoubtedly, you know. Well, not only that, actually, funnily enough, I mean, I've also found that people who, who do have faith, who are religious, who are part of various churches, are also threatened by it as well because it doesn't fit in with their, their teachings, if you like. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a lot of faiths that don't really talk about the afterlife. You know, they're, they're, they'll, they'll only talk about, say, for example, Christ and him going through the afterlife and returning and stuff. Or in, in, but, you know, this, so, so it, it is, yeah, it's true. You know, this, it doesn't always, not everybody wants to listen to it straight away, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's it's just something that I, I just feel well. I'm going to talk about it. If you want to hear my story, then that's great. You know, I'll be, I mean, I've done interviews. You know, I'm out. The, one of the first interviews I did on the radio actually was on like a sort of like a, a drive time show, if you like. And and I went on there, and I just thought I'd made a huge mistake at first because I went on air, and then they, I was warned before by the producer saying, right, um, we're just doing a news flash now, and then and then you'll be straight on. And now I could hear this guy talking, and he was, and yeah, yeah, right after the break, we're going to be talking to David Ditchfield. He had a near-death experience, and it was just kind of like, oh, no, it's sensationalizing <laughs> all of this. This is all wrong, you know, it's going to go terribly wrong. But interestingly enough, um, as soon as we started chatting and I started telling him about the whole thing, he was gripped, and he turned around to me. He said, we're going to come back to this after after the after the break and stuff, and uh he said, this is amazing. He said, he said, and uh, he said, look, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm supposed to be sort of like pulling you up on all this. He said, but I can't because this, this is just so powerful, this whole story. And it's making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And I'm just feeling like really drawn in by it. And it, it completely, and I thought, wow, that's great. If I can go on a show like that and talk about it, then that means that people do want to listen. And it's just, it, uh, it kind of summed up. The fact that none of us really think about death at all. I'm not saying that we should. I'm not saying that we should wake up every day over our morning coffee and talk about death. But I think it should be something that it's going to happen to us all. Let's face it. So we may as well just at least, you know, broach the subject, whatever our views are, and just have a chat about it. And so, so, so yeah, so that show was good. I was really glad that I did that show because it made me feel like, well, if I can do that and just talk about it on a show that really doesn't really want to talk about it but it was just a sensational subject and we ended up being a really good debate then then yeah people do actually want to talk about death a bit more than you realize well two things there uh, one is like you know you had a subjective experience with your uh, near death um episode the whole accident was your subjective experience because other people could witness it but they didn't experience it the way you did but subjectivity isn't trusted you know we're always told aren't we oh you can't trust your even even though your, your your grandmother might tell you, always listen to your inner voice, trust your feelings. Mm. In the public sphere, anywhere we're told, well, you can't be guided by gut instincts and hun mm. hunches and things like that. And you know, it doesn't matter what you feel about something. You know, if you've got a bad feeling about a situation or a good feeling, you know, that doesn't mean anything. It's subjective. But yet and all, the most important experiences in our lives are subjective, and they are also the things that science can say little or nothing about, such as love. You know, how do you put that, in, how do you put that into words? So, yeah, exactly. so subjectivity being derided when it's all we have, you know, scientists who are in a lab running tests think they're being objective, but they're, they're being, they're having a subjective experience by necessity. That's the way it is. And the other thing was about what you said about death, but talking about death at sea. And again, this is a relatively modern thing. And certainly in, in the Western world, you know, this taboo around death you can't talk we're not even allowed to see dead bodies anymore you know we don't when a member of the family dies we don't have them in the dining room anymore you know where people can go in and say you know pay their last respects we you know we just the body's gone that's it well we never see it again mm. fear of death is what drives a lot of i think our modern collective psychosis you know i could see i think mm. what you're even seeing in the world now with the with the coronavirus outbreak 
a lot of the decisions, a lot of the behavior, a lot of the fear has been driven because people are terrified of dying. I think it would change our culture and societies immensely if we had a, a better relationship with death. And uh, and this is what I think very powerfully experiences like yours get across um, if people are open, you know, to, to that message. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you totally. It's it was interesting actually because I got invited to go to the south of France last year to talk um about my near-death experience and and uh it was very last minute so i wasn't sure i was, talk- was going to be talking to but it was a retreat and uh they're all females they were on at the retreat and they were all um called uh, uh end of life midwives doulas and uh and i'd never heard of them before so of that expression and doulas or, or end of life midwives but um they're amazing, these people, you know, they, they, they basically what they do is, you know, they kind of, uh, they'll spend time helping people, you know, at, in hospices and stuff like that who know that they're going to die. And they're, and they're basically doing the same job as a, as a midwife would do, bringing a, 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 a child into the world, but they're helping the soul to move on. And not only that, it was run by, um, somebody who I've become really good friends with now. Um, and, um, she basically, runs a fantastic funeral service where all all what you've just talked about there is brought back in that, that um, she invites the people to do be with the body if they want they can they can you know she's a funeral director and she'll bring the body she'll uh, prepare it and beautifully they don't just do it it's, it's, it's a it's a ceremony where they wash the whole body down and uh, and they help the soul to, to, to pass on and they're happy to bring the body into the house and, and, like you just talked about and that, as they used to do and they can the family can even spend time for a couple of days with the body if they want you know and it's all very caring and very nurturing and i was, I was just so humbled by all this and it was just so great to see that this hap- this is happening that that, that that maybe we are starting to sort of turn things around and uh, uh, it's taking it away because it made me realize when i was over there i thought wow this is brilliant this is like you're actually giving the, the people a, a wonderful send-off but also the, the families and the loved ones as well to, to help see see their loved ones off because i thought to myself let's face it that the whole system we've had in terms of funeral directors it's all very antiquated it's still very victorian isn't it it's the whole setup with the you know the turning up with the with the top hats and <laughs> The, the hearse, it's all very, mm. very, very antiquated. It hasn't moved on since Victorian times, basically. So, so it's, I, I think that's started to shift as well. But it'll, it'll obviously take time, but it, it will. It, but, you know, but I don't know. But the, yeah, it's interesting what you said there. I was really shocked and taken back by the, the response when the coronavirus first kicked in, the, the amount of fear. And I couldn't, I thought, what is everybody so scared of? I, I, I couldn't quite get it at first, you know, but, but, um, yeah, there was a lot of chaos and, uh, and, and again, going back to, to scientists and stuff, I think that there was, because there was no scientists hadn't got a grip on it, I think that was frightening everybody as well, wasn't it? Everybody was kind of thinking, well, is this going to just kind of wipe out mankind? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, with the, yeah. without, without getting into a discussion of this, because sure. that's another subject, and I have discussed it extensively in recent weeks, mm. but you sure. know, we were explicitly told to be afraid. We were terrorized with information. It doesn't mean, that, right. doesn't mean there's no threat, but we were explicitly terrorized by politicians in the media. Um, mm. I, I can't imagine uh, someone who's in the habit of watching 24 7 rolling news especially if they've got nothing else to do at the minute if they're just doing that all day i can't imagine what state of mind that would leave you in you just oh man yeah and it doesn't (laughs) it it doesn't mean don't be aware of what you know you can't stick your hand head in the sand either but no 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 not at all yeah yeah i mean i I mean that's it i'm i decided right from the off i thought i've got to i've got to really sort of rationalize how much i'm watching of the news footage and so i just i used to stick on the News first thing in the morning and grab the headlines, what's going on, and then wait until news night <laughs> just to see the in-depth sort of, you know, sort of debates on what was happening. And, that, and that's all you need to do if you, cause it's, it's just, yeah, it is. I mean, we, we become addicted to it, don't we, as well? It's, it's a very addictive thing, news, especially when it's something so terrifying as that. Yeah. Well, I decided it was on March the 17th. Oh, on March the 16th, it may be in the morning of the 17th that I listened to the radio news on the BBC, and that's the last time I did it. I made a conscious, because I could see where this was going, I could see what was coming, mm. and I made, I made a conscious decision to completely stop. Now, obviously, I know more or less what's going on, because I'm 
people are talking about it, you know, and uh, I, I do I do come into contact with people, you know, talk to people. So I think it was definitely the right move, and I don't I don't think I'll actually go back to it. I don't think I'll ever consume media news like that again, like I used to. Not that it was a lot, but it was you know, yeah, it was yeah. once a day. But I can't tell you, and maybe you can appreciate some of this. The when you're just not looking at that stuff, the clarity with which you can see the situation. And I'm not saying I'm special here, but I feel in my own mind, for my own sake, I've got really clear feelings, about, uh, not feelings, that's uh, clear ideas, clear concepts, impressions about what's occurring. I feel I can see it very clearly in a way that feels clear to me anyway. And I mm. don't think that will be the case if I was getting the aforementioned 24-7 fear propaganda, for want of a better word. Well, that's true. I mean, the when it all first happened, when it reached its peak, I, one thing I did, I looked at the positive that was coming out of it as well, and that was that I did see that a lot of people were actually stopping because the whole world had stopped to sort of almost get in touch with their high consciousness, if you like. You know, people were just like sort of appreciating their homes and nature and, and you know, everyone was starting to bake bread and teaching their children from home and just going back to the complete authentic lifestyle and, and enjoying it you know people were creating and getting very creative and stuff and so that was the positive that came out of it and i was hoping that that would be a big shift in the world that we might actually just kind of think you know wow we were just the world was just going too fast and getting a bit crazy so but uh maybe that will be the case maybe that'll be the outcome of it i don't know i hope so i i, th- I do too i think there are some things we can salvage from this going forward if we want to it may be too much to hope for it to be across all of society, but I think many individuals will be able to take things away from this and uh, and do things differently. I hope so. Returning to your experience, now we've talked about your painting briefly, and also then you started to compose classical music. Now the mm. section in the book where you talk about writing your first piece, that was eventually performed by an orchestra mm. at a public concert. I mean, it's an extraordinary story, and you've been kind enough to to share uh, the music, uh, that particular first uh, symphony in three movements that you wrote. And yeah. l- listeners will be able to find out when we sign off today where they can they can check that out. But that was an incredible story in itself. And it was interesting that somewhat with the painting, but definitely with the music, that even after your near-death experience, you know, you, were, you still had some of the same doubts would creep in again about you know, whether you were up to the job, why would anybody want to listen to anything you'd written? Are these people better educated than me? Does that make them better than me? You know, those things weren't, mm. they weren't completely gone, were they? No, no. I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, at the end of the day, every person who's had a near-death experience will say this to you. You know, it, it, we're, we're, we're still, you know, living beings. We're, 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 it, it hasn't completely turned us into these amazing people or whatever. You know, it's, yes, it's um, we've had amazing things happen to us, but of course we're, we, we're you know, we're, we're open to some of these things. I mean, it, it was, it was, I, I'd say for, for anyone to have to walk, I remember walking into the very first rehearsal, you know, and, uh, and I walked into that room and, and I, I saw this orchestra all sat there and I'd walk, and orchestras are very kind of, they're very highly educated. It's like a very highly educated middle class arena, if you like. And I remember just walking in and just, and part of me felt was really excited, but part of me was thinking, Oh, wow. Yeah. This is me again. This is, this is David of old. You know, I'm a working class guy and how they're going to take me seriously. And the conductor turned around and said, David, would you like to talk about your, your piece? And I was going, No, that's fine. You know, you, you just go ahead and say it. He said, No, 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 please step forward. And interestingly enough, when I did start talking about it, because it was about my near-death experience, I just felt that, again, I was being guided as I spoke, and I was being given this strength and this courage to be able to talk to the or- to the orchestra. And they listened, and, and they were very, very drawn in by the whole thing, which was fantastic. Yes, there were moments throughout those rehearsals where I, I get caught, caught where they'd turn around and say, uh, David, you know, you've got here a, a you know, C sharp. Uh, I'm sure that's supposed to be a, an E flat major, isn't it? And, and, you know, isn't that a diminished um, seventh? And I'm kind of going, what are they talking about? This complete science to me, you know. And I was worried that they were going to catch me out and say, wow, he's a fake. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there were moments where it was very terrifying. And, um, but that, as I say, I'm only human, so. So I'm, I'm, you know, 
I, I, you know, I was still dealing with insecurities as well. I was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder as well. You know, I'd been under a train, and and uh, as I said to you, the mind and body is not set up for something so terrifying as that. So there was still lots for me to deal with from that point of view. You continued to paint and write music, I assume. Um, yeah. And obviously, you'd be speaking wherever you get the opportunity about your experience. Have does that constitute? Um, a living for you now, um, or have you have you you know have you gone back to some other sort of work? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering in terms of how your life has moved on. Yeah, no, it's moved on incredibly. Yeah, I mean, I don't do manual work anymore. Well, I can't, so I wouldn't be able to um, uh, because of my physical injuries. But um, yeah, my 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 life now is is basically it's 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 completely feels like I describe it as being three dimensional now because it's I'm creating all the time and uh, some of the creative work I do is 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 more commercial and so it's not necessarily you know just selling paintings or music on based on my spiritual happenings and, and, and awarenesses so but an awful lot of it is because an awful lot of people are interested in that I was you know I was um I was recently commissioned by this group called the Cambridge clarinet choir and uh, they and they Two of the members of it had played in, in that first orchestra, and uh, they, and they got hold of me years later and said, "Oh, we'd like to commission you to write something for us." So I went along to meet them all, and they got all these different sized clarinets. Like the the bass clarinet is just kind of like it's about six foot in length, and you know. And I said, "Well, let's hear it." And so he blew it. It sounded like a you know like a, an ocean liner coming into the dock, and uh, mm-hmm. you know it was fantastic sounds. And so and they said to me, "We'd like you to write something." spiritual because we heard that your piece was so beautiful and said fantastic so so yeah so it feels like things have come in into my life that where people have wanted me to sort of express my stuff um, you know and, and get paid for it you know <laughs> which is fantastic you know and, um which is all based on my everything seems to be pretty much based around my my nde which is fantastic so i'm very blessed and and, and um you know this the the book is the next stage for me, you know, it's, um, it's something that I'd obviously wanted to do a lot, uh, you know, a lot earlier, but with my dyslexia, it's taken a long time to reach this point, but I'm here and, uh, you know, and it's coming out. I, it's, and I'm very excited about it because it's, it's also bringing me to a new platform as well, which is talking to people like yourself and, and to others and being able to sort of talk more verbally about my experience, which is great because I can talk more at length because when I've been promoting music and, and stuff before, it te- they tend to have been just kind of like, you know, f- five or ten minute interviews basically. And, and, and so it's nice to be able to just talk about things at, at, at a bit more length because, you know, it's, it's, it's a big story for me because there's so many different elements that have come out of it. It's not just, you know, talking about, um, uh, surviving death and, and, and not, and not fearing it. It's also, the big, the massive learning curve for me that I want everyone to be able to try and get, and that is that I learned the, the big thing I brought back from that that near death experience was was self love, and I got none of that before. You know, I didn't even I didn't even realise I got a soul. You know, <laughs> my soul had been sat inside this body of mine throughout all those years, and I hadn't even let it come to the surface because I was taught self love when I was on the other side, and I brought that back with me, and and it's that has enabled me to do so many of the things that I do now because because I've got that self-love and once you've got that self-love it gives you an un- enormous amount of self-confidence to try things to sort of you know step outside the um the comfort zone as it were you know and push yourself and these are all things I think that people in general who've never had anything like this sort of experience can can benefit from from hearing your story and that of others who who have gone through these things with you know self-love Losing, yeah. losing this fear of death and also meaning and purpose in life. This is one of the other great maladies of the 21st century Western mindset is, you know, it's all pointless, purposeless. There's no meaning in anything except what we give it. Uh, the, yeah. univer- the universe is just a big clockwork machine grinding on and then, you know, the, we just die and that's it. And, and yeah. all of those things taken together are incredibly toxic. So I'd urge people to to get your book and to read it and enjoy it. And and there are many other books documenting people's personal near-death experiences. And there are many studied as, studies as well, uh, like Lessons from the Light, I think is Kenneth Ring's book. Uh, if anyone's interested and they're new to the NDE world, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, studies and 
documented cases going back decades and decades, and it's very compelling taken together. And I think you'll have appreciated the value of becoming part of a community. You know, when you thought you were on your own, and you're the only person to ever gone through this. Mm. When, you, when you realized, you know, how, uh, what a, a universal experience this is in the sense of not everyone experiencing it, but across the species and across time, yeah. you know, then that imbues it with further mystery and meaning as well. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it is, I'm never looking for confirmation, but, but it's, it's like affirmation, if you like. So, mm. if, you know, the more people I speak to about it that, that have had similar experiences to me or what have you, it's like, yes, that's, that's fantastic that you, you had all those things happen as well. You felt like that when you were in the hospital too. Yeah. And all these different things that we all kind of share, we all, all our experiences are different, but there's a, there's a common thread. There's a common thread, which is great. So, and it, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that. So many more people are talking about it than what I figured as well. That's amazing, you know, especially in, in America, you know, in, in the US. They're, just, they're really, really keen to sort of broach the whole subject and on, on near death experience, which is fantastic, you know. And well, the UK more as well, you know, we're really, we're really opening up to it a lot more than what it's, it's brilliant. It, seems to, it just seems like it's opening up all the time, uh, the whole subject, which is fantastic. It is, it is. Uh, yeah, and you, I'll leave, I'll leave it for listeners to find out in your book just the details of your of your experience in terms of like but you, you encountered beings shall we say which is a common experience yeah. and, the, and if there was one message i suppose to take away it seems to me uh reading about near-death experiences is like don't be afraid don't no. live in, don't live in fear of death don't be so yes. af- don't be so afraid of dying that you never start living yeah uh, yeah and, uh, exactly so, okay well Today, David, we've been talking about of uh, your experience, which is laid out in your book. It's called Shine On. That's coming out uh, this month, June the twenty sixth. Uh, before we sign off, just give listeners details of your website, and I'm assuming that there they can find out all about uh, your your painting and your music as well. That's right. Yeah, um, the website is uh, shineonthestory.com. And everything's on there. Basically, you can you can get links to to listen to the to the music, the symphony we've just been talking about, because because I've got a SoundCloud page, but so you can stream it for free and just and listen to that. Also, um, my artwork as well is on the website and my Instagram page, which you can link up to, and my Facebook page. So if you just go there that's probably the best thing is, is just to have a look on there and you'll find the links for all the various resources and, and if you want to sign up to my facebook page or instagram then that's great because you can keep on top of what what's happening you know i'll be sort of like especially at the moment i'm putting out lots of different you know interviews and stuff that people can listen to if they want like yourselves and so people can link onto those and see what's happening with the book release because that's getting exciting now because it's going to be four weeks <laughs> off i can't believe it it's 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 come around so quick you know so so yeah so i'm very excited so please go and have a look yeah so shine on the story.com excellent well once again david thank you so much for joining us today on legalizefreedom.com oh it's been a pleasure it's been great chatting